Okay, ionic bonding. Let's draw Lewis symbols for potassium and for chlorine. So let me find a pen here. That's a good color. So drawing a Lewis symbol for potassium, we just put the element symbol, and then the number of dots that we put around it is equal to the number of valence electrons for that atom. So how many valence electrons does potassium have? One. So we put a dot. Sometimes things are just that simple. And it doesn't matter where the dot goes. Right? It doesn't matter where the dot goes. Um, preferably either on top, on bottom, on the right, or on the left. Not like kitty corner, you know, north, south, east, west, not northeast, right? Just because it's easier to see. It's like dice, kind of. If they're in a particular order, you can tell how many there are without having to count them. So chlorine. How many valence electrons does chlorine have? Seven. Remember, the number of group, electro uh, group electrons, the number of valence electrons, is the same as the group number for the main group elements. So this has seven. So here, um, we want to put, you want to have pairs of electrons, but you want to spread them out. So one way to get this straight is just to put one on each side, north, south, east, and west, and then pair them up as needed. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you should have one that's not paired and then three pairs of electrons. Because this would be eight. Those are the possible positions for the dots. But we don't have eight, we only have seven. OK? So we look at potassium, and here's its um, electron configuration. And we see here it has one electron in the 4s subshell. That's its valence electron. When we make an ion out of potassium, it loses that one electron. And so then what does it have? Well, when we're looking at the Lewis structure, we see that losing this electron, now going down here, we have a complete octet. Right? So if I make this into an ion, I do that by losing the electron. So if I erase that electron, oops, that's not the eraser. If I erase that electron, then I have to put a plus here because it has a charge on it now. But that electron has to go somewhere. Do you see anybody else on this page that maybe would like an electron? The chlorine. So what happens is potassium will give its electron to chlorine. Now the chlorine has a negative charge. That negative can kind of get lost in all the dots. And so we always put a bracket around a, ne a negative ion and the charge on the outside. OK? So positive ion, negative ion, they're going to attract. Now it looks like this potassium doesn't have any electrons now, right? It lost its one valence electron. Instead of now drawing eight electrons around it for this third level, we just understand that when you peel off all the valence electrons, you've got an octet underneath. And so when we make these Lewis symbols and do these things, the number of dots on your page stays the same. You just shuffle them around. So we don't want to have all of a sudden eight dots appearing out of nowhere. We just understand that those are from the core and they're not shown. Any questions? You guys don't look very impressed by this. It's OK. OK, use little symbols to protect the formula for the compound that forms between magnesium and nitrogen. So magnesium and nitrogen, we need to draw the Lewis symbols for magnesium and for nitrogen. How many valence electrons does magnesium have? What group is it in? It's in group two. So let's give it two dots. How many does nitrogen have? Five. So nitrogen is going to have one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So 
when this compound forms, we know we have a metal and a nonmetal. This is going to be an ionic compound. So magnesium is going to lose electrons. Nitrogen is going to gain electrons. And they're going to do this in order to have an octet. So it's like, OK, we need to share these dots so that everybody can be happy. One thing I like about Lewis structures is you can make everyone happy most of the time. OK, so magnesium says, hey, I've got two electrons I want to get rid of. Do I have anybody willing to take these electrons from me? And nitrogen says, me, 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 I'll take them. Yeah, I, I could never do that with Hot Wheel cars, but somehow I can do it with, um, with dots. So actually, I was going to color code this. Let me, let me go back, because I forgot. I won't color code things later because it does get tedious, but I'll do it here. So here's magnesium. We'll make magnesium green just because and magnesium has green dots. There we go. So magnesium is going to get rid of its, its two green dots, its two electrons, Oops. by giving them to nitrogen. So now nitrogen has a green dot there and a green dot there. These are now ions. They have charges. So magnesium is a two, <laughs> wrong pen, two plus. And what's the charge on the nitrogen? Two minus. Two minus, because it gained two electrons, right? Is everybody happy? No. Magnesium's happy because it lost those two valence electrons, but underneath is a complete octet. Nitrogen is happier, but still not good. Happy is eight valence electrons. Well, if you have one magnesium atom, you probably have more than one around. So let's draw another magnesium atom and see if we can fix this. So here's another magnesium atom. Like all other magnesium atoms, it has two valence electrons. So this nitrogen is so close. It has seven electrons now, seven valence electrons. And it sees this magnesium. Hey, can I have one of those? Magnesium says, sure. I'd like to get rid of both of them. Do you want both of them? Nitrogen says, no. I'm going to be full up if I take one. But magnesium says, well, getting rid of one is better than none at all. So I'll give that to you. Now the charge on the nitrogen has changed because the nitrogen has gained three electrons, so the charge is now three minus. Everybody okay with that? What's the charge on this magnesium ion? Plus one, just plus. Is everyone happy yet? Nope. The first magnesium is good, the nitrogen is good, but now we've got this not quite happy magnesium. Well, we're gonna have to bring in another nitrogen. Because we need somebody who's willing to take another electron, right? So let's pull in another nitrogen atom. This nitrogen atom also has five valence electrons. And the exact place you put those is not, you know, if you want to put the pair on the left, that's fine. So the magnesium says, hey, hey, I've got this one electron. Would you take it off my hands? So nitrogen says, sure, I'd love that electron. So we move this electron from the magnesium to the nitrogen. And this causes some charges to form, right? So now this nitrogen has gained one electron. One extra electron makes it a one minus ion. And the magnesium now has lost two electrons, so it's a two plus. Is everybody happy? No. Does it seem like we're going to go around in circles doing this all day long? Yeah, this is like my, my grandma. She, um, she was rather large. Uh, she, she liked her food. She had bread and with it. With it could be butter, could be jam, whatever. So you'd pass the rolls and she'd take some bread and some with it. And then, you know, she'd put the the jam or whatever on the bread, and she'd eat the bread, but there was a little bit of jam left. So then you have to take another roll, right? So you put that on there, but then you don't have enough with it. So you, yeah, back and forth like that. It's a great excuse to eat a lot of food. Anyway, so that's, that's what this feels like. 
Well, we just have to tough it out and keep going. It's going to work out pretty soon. So we need another magnesium atom, two valence electrons. There they are. OK, so here's another magnesium atom, wants to get rid of two electrons. This nitrogen needs how many? Two. So this is where things straighten out. So the magnesium will give those two electrons to the nitrogen. The magnesium now has a two plus charge. And what's the charge on the, mag on the nitrogen? How many electrons did it get? This nitrogen gained how many electrons? It gained three. It's got three green dots from where it came. OK, so three minus. So we can do that with the dots, and then we count up how many of each we have. How many magnesiums are there? There's three. And how many nitrogens? Two. That's the formula for magnesium nitride. Now, are you going to do this whole thing every time? Absolutely not. But the Lewis model illustrates why the formula for magnesium nitride is this. It's, it has to do with the electrons, and specifically the valence electrons and them gaining and losing electrons to, gain, to have an octet, because that's a, an especially low energy situation for the atoms. Any questions? You can do this with any ions. Yeah? So when it comes to transitional metals, you that. Do transitional metals always have two That's a good question. What about the transition metals? Transition metals, as we've seen with their charges, are kind of squirrely, right? Most transition metals have two valence electrons. And plus two is a very common. Um, charge for those transition metals, but sometimes they're plus three, or four, or five, or six, or one, and some of them only have one valence electron because of that irregularity that they do with the, the um, orbital diagrams. So they're not very predictable. So we, ha we can't really do this very well with the transition metals. So. So, that's like all of them <laughs> so so that's why in the name of, of an ionic compound with a transition metal, we have the Roman numeral that tells us what the charge is. Or if we have the formula, we know what the charge on the anion is, and so we can figure it out. And so we do have to have that information hidden either either in the either either. <laughs> I've heard it both ways, either in the um, formula or in the name. Any other questions? OK, lattice energy, the rest of the story. You guys are probably all too young for Paul Harvey, huh? He used to be on the radio and he'd tell this story, and then there'd be a commercial. And now for the rest of the story, sorry, that's for the old people. Anyway, so we know that the formation of ionic compounds is usually quite exothermic. This happens with a lot of energy being released. Sometimes it's explosive. So sodium metal reacting with chlorine gas will form sodium chloride. And the heat of formation for that is minus 411 kilojoules per mole. That means it releases 411 kilojoules for every mole of sodium chloride formed. So we can look at ionization energies, and we can look at the electron affinities and try to figure out what's going on here. So the ionization energy for sodium is plus 496. So in order to form a sodium plus ion, you have to put 496 kilojoules of energy into the sodium. Now, you know, I was talking about magnesium is wanting to get rid of these electrons. Actually, it wants to sell them. Uh, you have to pay it. It's not just going to throw electrons at you. You have to pull them off. So this is an endothermic process, always, an ionization energy. Electron affinity for chlorine is, is often negative for elements that form anions. And so here, 
that's minus 349 kilojoules. When you give an electron to chlorine, it releases 349 kilojoules of energy. So if we add these two together, we can see that the transfer of an electron from sodium to chlorine actually is endothermic. It absorbs 147 kilojoules per mole. And yet when we do the reaction and measure it, we get a release of 411 kilojoules per mole. That doesn't add up, so we must be missing something. And the thing that's missing here is something called lattice energy. So lattice energy is the energy associated with the formation of a crystalline lattice of alternating ions. So you make the ions, the sodium ions and the chloride ions. Now they are attracted to each other, and they're going to stick together like those magnetic building toys, right? And so that is a spontaneous and exothermic process. And the potential energy is lowered when those opposite charges come together. They're attracted to each other. So as they come together, they release energy, and that energy is released as heat. So this is important to understand. We talk about it a little differently because that helps us to remember what's going on. But this is, this is the truth here. The formation of ionic compounds is not exothermic because the metal wants to lose an electron, and the nonmetal wants to gain an electron. It's exothermic because there's a large amount of heat released when the cations and anions coalesce to form a lattice. So you make the ions, and you know they're separated from each other. And when they come together like magnets together, that releases energy. Does that make sense? Because opposite charges don't want to be separated. Think about two magnets, especially two really strong magnets. You know, those neodymium ones are really fun. Also very dangerous if you eat them, don't eat them. Um, it takes a lot of energy to pull them apart, right? If it's energy to pull them apart, then when they go together, they release energy. So this is like magnets clicking together. Does that make sense? So here we have a whole bunch of sodium and chloride ions that are separated from each other. And when they whoosh, stick together, they release energy. The energy that's released there is the lattice energy. So how can you calculate the lattice energy? We use what's called a Born-Haber cycle. This is a hypothetical series of steps that represents forming an ionic compound from its elements. What we're doing is we're using Hess's law, which says that you just need the beginning and the end, and then you can put together whatever things you find useful as long as it adds up to the overall reaction. So we also need to know the overall change in enthalpy, and then we can calculate the lattice energy. So here is an illustration of a Born-Haber cycle for the formation of sodium chloride. So we're starting right here. Here we have sodium, metal, and chlorine gas. These are in their normal states, right? So we imagine what would have to happen to make a uh, sodium chloride from this. So the sodium, um, well, here, this is a solid. And so we need to make the sodium into a gas. And so we're going to make that into a gas. This is um, an enthalpy change, a standard enthalpy that we know. It's being find it in a table. And then we need to separate the chlorine. It's a molecule. We need to separate that into individual chlorine uh, atoms. And so that's going to require some energy. That's why energy is going up here. And then we need to ionize the sodium. We have to put energy in to take the electron off the sodium. So all of those are endothermic processes. Now we have taking that electron that we pulled off from sodium and giving it to chlorine. That's an exothermic process. Now we have the ions, and they can be attracted to each other and form the ionic compound as a solid. And so that energy change is pretty exothermic, and that's going from here all the way down to there. That's not something that we can measure directly. 
We can measure each of these steps, but we can't measure this lattice energy. But we can measure the overall heat of formation going from sodium and chlorine to sodium chloride in the solid state. And so when we know all of the pieces, my stupid pointer, except for this one, we can get that by subtracting and adding. So we've got this, all the, all the arrows pointing up would be plus and all the ones pointing down would be negative. And we add them together. Does that make sense? You could think of this in terms of um, a change in elevation that maybe you were going, um, you're starting here and you're going to end up here. And you want to know there was also this place in here. And you want to know how far this is. But you can't measure it directly. But you can go like this, and you can measure this step, and this step, and this step, and this step, and this step. And then you could figure out the blue, right? If you were, going, you were starting here, and you went up and up and up, and then you came down a little bit, and then you know that overall from the beginning to the end, that's here, and so then you could find this difference. Engineers end up having to do that sort of thing, except way more complicated. Any questions? This is Hess's law. You could take all of these um, chemical equations and add them together, and you could take all the changes in enthalpy and add them together, and that's what we're doing here. So there are trends in the lattice energy, and we need to um, have a basic understanding of these. One of the trends is ion size. So we can, we, can <clears throat> we can determine the lattice energies for these different metal chlorides. So lithium, sodium, potassium, and cesium. These are all alkali metals. And we see there's a trend here. The lattice energy is more negative, more exothermic for lithium chloride. And as we go to sodium, potassium, and cesium, it becomes less endo endothermic exothermic, sorry, less energy is released. And that has to do with the size of the metal cation. So we learned earlier when we talked about periodic trends that as you go down a group in the periodic table, the size of the atom or the ion increases. And these are all with chlorine, right? So lithium here is the smallest ion, and then sodium and potassium and cesium is the largest. Well, the lattice energy is affected by how close those atoms can get. And so we could look at their bond length, um, and we see that because lithium is a smaller ion, the distance between the lithium nucleus and the chloride nucleus is only 241 picometers. And as the size of the cation increases, the distance between the centers of those ions increases. And we learned that Coulomb's law tells us that the energy is proportional to 1 over the distance between those charged objects. Okay, think magnets on the fridge. You've got a magnet on the fridge. Nothing between the refrigerator and the magnet sticks really great. Put three pieces of paper under there, and now, you know, depending on the strength of the magnet, you might see the paper, you know, the magnet's stuck, but it's just slowly sliding down the fridge. Has that ever happened to you? It's just that little bit of change in the distance, the separation caused by the three pieces of paper that changes the attractive force. So this is like putting more and more sheets of paper between the magnets. There's more distance, and so the force of attraction is less, and the energy released when that happens is less. Does that make sense? Another uh, thing that affects lattice energy is the charge on the ions. So Coulomb's law tells us that the energy is proportional to the charge on one times the charge on the other. The, the full Coulomb's law that you should remember is that E is proportional to Q1, Q2, over R. And if you remember that, you can 
reason out some of these things. Well, here we're, we're comparing sodium fluoride and calcium oxide. We chose these because the bond length is similar in both of them, because we know that the bond length is going to affect the lattice energy. So we want to take that out of the picture and just look at charges. So similar bond, bond length, but here the calcium is plus 2 and the oxygen is plus 2. Plus 2 times minus 2 is negative 4. So Q1, Q2 is negative 4 for this one, and it's only negative 1 for that one. More negative means more attraction. So we would expect the lattice energy for this one to be larger, and it is. It's a lot bigger. In fact, it's roughly four times larger, right? 900 times 4 would be 3,600. So that's ballpark. Any questions? Coulomb's law, very useful thing. You increase the radius of the ions, the distance between them becomes less and less exothermic. You increase the charges, it becomes more exothermic. Yeah, that's what I just said. So we should be able to predict relative lattice energies. So arrange the following in order of increasing magnitude of lattice energy. Lithium bromide, potassium iodide, and calcium oxide. So these can be um, somewhat like those logic puzzles. So let's look at what we've got here. We've got lithium plus bromide is minus 1. And we've got potassium is a plus 1 and iodine is a minus one. And then we've got calcium is two plus and oxygen is two minus. We have to consider size and charge. Charge is going to be a very big factor. So if we look at the charges here, um, and we're thinking about Q1 times Q2, here, this would be minus 1, and this would be minus 1, and that's minus 4. That's four times larger. So that's going to be the biggest effect. So which one of these is going to have the largest lattice energy? The calcium oxide. Because its charge quotient is four times bigger. So we're supposed to arrange these in order of increasing magnitude. That means the absolute number. So calcium oxide, we're going to predict that's the largest one. And then we've got the other two are going to go in there. So now when we're looking at these two, lithium bromide and potassium iodide, the charges are the same, so let's look at their ion sizes. So if we look at bromide and iodide, okay, here's bromine and iodide. Which one's bigger, iodide or bromide? Iodide. iodide. So bromide is smaller and iodide is bigger. This is looking at the size. And then let's look at lithium and potassium. Those are over here. Here's lithium and here's potassium. Which one's larger? Potassium. So the lithium is smaller and the potassium is bigger. And that's looking at their sizes. So it looks like lithium is the smaller cation and bromide is the smaller anion. Those are together here. These are both the smaller of the pair. These are both the larger of the pair. Which one has a larger lattice energy? The smaller ions because they can get closer together. So the one with the smaller ions is in the middle, and the one with the big ions is over here at the beginning. Any questions? There will be a question like this on the next exam, guaranteed. Not those same compounds, but something just like it. So let's look at um, how our ionic bonding model matches up with reality. 
does this explain our observed properties of ionic compounds? We observe that ionic compounds have high melting points. This is because, and it is explained by the fact that these ionic bonds are non-directional. So you have attractions for this sodium ion, you have attractions with the chloride ions in all directions. And so that is going to be stronger than a covalent bond where you just have attraction in one direction. So a high melting point corresponds to strong attractions. So that works. Um, ionic compounds as solids do not conduct electricity. A solid block of salt won't conduct electricity. So these are non-conductors. Um, and this model explains that because in, in the solid here, the ions are fixed in place. They can't move. In order for current to um, be conducted, there has to be some charged thing that can move. Now, we know that um, if we melt this ionic solid, did you know that you can melt table salt? You can. Uh, probably not at home in your kitchen. It melts at a very, very high temperature, but it can be melted. If you melt it, then the ions can move, and molten sodium chloride will conduct electricity. We know that solutions of ionic compounds conduct electricity. So here's the solid, will not conduct electricity. When we put the sodium chloride in water, the ions are able to separate from each other, and now the light bulb goes on it can conduct electricity. So this model does explain ionic bonding. Any questions? <laughs>